Hello and welcome to Capital Market Live on Channels Television. I'm Will Ebang. Let's kick off with events that took place in the Nigerian capital market, starting with the NGX Group's 61st annual general meeting. The Nigerian Exchange Group, PLC, that's the NGX Group, held its 61st annual general meeting in Lagos on Friday, September the 30th. Uh, and according to the Chief Executive Officer of the NGX Group, Mr. Oscar Oyema, the group recorded a 22% increase in profit, a third 13% increase in gross, gross earnings and 14.9% growth in revenue. He further noted that the group intends to enhance its performance going forward and call for support from all stakeholders. I have joining me to review this event and many more, uh, Mr. Onose Asotia Inaholo, Investment Analyst, Main Street Capital. Many thanks for coming on the show, Onase. Hi, Good evening. Now, we saw the NGX Group share price jump by more than 2% on Friday. It was, it topped, it was one of the, the stocks that gained the most for the week. Uh, does that indicate that investors as the shareholders are satisfied with the NGX performance so far, given that they just had their AGM? Uh, well, um, in finance, it's, it's the numbers dictate. Um, numbers are king. Um, Investors or shareholders will be happy if the numbers are good. And so far, with NGX Group, the numbers are good. And you know the fact that they had an AGM, and you know um, the, the chairman spoke about how profitable the company was. Um, that itself is a um, positive sentiment. You know, and it's like okay, that is a go ahead from the management. Numbers here is good. The management says, oh, things are going well, we are hopeful, hopeful for the future. So that's, it's kind of like a green light all around. And so it's natural that, you know, after that, we see a jump in share price. Well, one of the reasons, or one of the reasons they had this uh, AGM, or one of the agenda on the items on the agenda was to raise capital of up to 35 billion naira for business expansion. But However, it wasn't ex uh, presented at the AGM. Uh, do you understand why, or can you tell us why this didn't happen? Or do you think they feel it's not the right time to raise funds? Um, well, we know that you know there have uh, these, been certain changes right now, um, recent changes in um, you know the company's governance structure. You know, some people on the board, some people were. Um, uh, re-elected some people step down you know so right now you know we don't have all the data we don't have all the facts all the facts are not presented to the public um now what we know is we had an expansion plan and they decided we could not go ahead with it right now now it's not necessarily negative a negative thing or it's not like a ne it's not negative that they decided not to move ahead right now um, they just decided not to move ahead. Okay, it, it doesn't negatively impact the company's finances in any way. So um, they said right now they want to keep interacting with shareholders. No problem. Um, we we'll keep doing that. I mean, at this point, time is the best. You know, is the best revealer. And um, we're going to see in time. You know what they are going to do, and you know that in itself will determine if them. You know, not raising this was positive or then, you know, raising it when it was negative. Like I say, hindsight is 2020. Uh, so we have to move ahead in the future and then see what happened before we can now look back and maybe see oh, this was a positive thing or this was a negative thing. Okay, so moving on, we see also this week that the Central Bank of Nigeria at its Monetary Policy Committee meeting raised interest rates by 150 basis points, so 15.5% from 14%, all in a bid to tame inflation. However, there's been some controversy around the rate hike. We see international bodies like the IMF, International Monetary Fund, warning against the CBN raising this rate. What are some of the fears or the negative results of raising rates and what did the IMF see that made them uh, so uh, against this rate hike? Um, well, uh, the thing is, um, first we kind of have to now look at why we are raising rates. Um, in, a, in, in an efficient economy, um, and we, we see economies like the US and UK you know, um, Europe, they've been raising rates. And we say, okay, we want to raise rates to fight inflation. But then we have seen the fallout of, you know, raising rates in a bit to fight inflation. And so the IMF is like, look, you guys don't have 
such a great economy already. You know, it's not like the economy is naturally strong. You don't have such a great economy, and then you are making it hard, you know, um, for businesses to, to access debt funding. And so now they're just trying to look at the fallout, you know, from, from, from what could happen. Because big economies like the US, I mean, if you look at their indices, I mean, for risky securities, it's all going down. I mean, uh, prices are still going up. And even if you look at charts, you know, um, yes, they have to keep increasing rates higher for to tame inflation. And that, that hasn't really yielded, you know, a um, hundred percent positive results so far. I mean, we see, we see the Fed still talking about, you know, wanting to keep increasing rates because they haven't seen, you know, the metrics or the factors that will show them that, oh, inflation is actually coming down. And then when you even now look at Nigeria, I mean, inflation comes in different flavors. You look at Nigeria's inflation, it's not because we printed a lot of money or because the government has been buying up corporate debts and, and corporate bonds. Um, it's simply cost push inflation. Uh, inflation is skyrocketing because you know, um, the cost of input materials, customs are going up. Epileptic power supply, these things are increasing the cost of production. Raising um, interest rates, um, it, it doesn't really solve that problem, you know, and, and so the IMF, they see things like that, and all it's really going to do, it might have some effect on inflation, um, but all it's really going to do is make it harder to do business and, and possibly even slow down the economy. So, and these are things that the IMF sees, and, and that's why they are warning us against raising rates. So from obviously from what you've just said now, the, you do not believe that this rate hike, which is the highest since 2006, will be effective in taming inflation. But what are the implications for the equities market? Yes, we do know that investors will definitely flock to the fixed income market. We already saw that with the NTB auction where the one year paper was overbought because people wanted to start, you know, cashing in on that 12 percent yield. Now, will there be an exer exacerbation without be a, a deepening or or of this current downtrend in equities, for equities, for investors that are there? Well, naturally, yes. You expect that when interest rates are increased, you know, uh, there will be a downtrend in equities. And we've already been kind of been on a downtrend. And it is expected that um, the, raise, the, the rise in rates will um, exacerbate um, the current downtrend. But it, it's funny because one of the reasons, it's not just because rates have been increased. I mean, I mean, the Treasury um, bond auction that took place, I think, Wednesday or Thursday, where the one-year Treasury bill jumped from about 8.5 to about 12 percent. That is significant um, because right now, even if even if, well, with bonds, people do not really want to buy long-term bonds um, because there's still this uncertainty, you know, about the future of Nigeria, you know, our economy. And so right now, treasury bills are you know, guaranteed and they are liquid, you know. And, and so, yes, people are, are, are moving, you know, because, okay, these, these yields, you know, these yields are better. And not just because, oh, they are better, they are guaranteed. There's a premium on the fact that they are guaranteed. So it, 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 getting 12% in equities is not the same as getting 12% in bonds because of the premium on, on, you know, on that guarantee, you know. So, yes, we expect that. Um, more people are going to move away from, away from the equities. But it might not be as, um, I guess, terrible as we expect. Uh, because even when you look at this week, you, have, you would have expected that, okay, rates, rates were raised on, um, was it Wednesday or Thursday? And you, know, you see them trooping out on Friday. But that wasn't what happened, you know? Uh, and probably we'll get to that later. But yes, you know, we will see downtrends you know, but it may not be as terrible as mm -hmm. as as we had formerly hoped, provided you know um, um, certain things come into play. Um, we, you know, we do it towards the end of the year. So talking about things coming into play, you now what strategies can equity investors adopt in this elevated interest rate environment? Can you just share some insight into that? Yes. Um, well, one right now. Um, I, I believe I said this before, it's, it's a game of fundamentals. You know, people are looking at companies. People know that, okay, the general market trend is going down. So, I mean, market pressure will pull, you know, um, um, stock prices down. So now it's a game of fundamentals. People are looking into stocks that, believe, that they believe are, are strong fundamentally. And, and 
um, Q3 results that will soon come out are really important. You know, they are, they are going to be really important right now because they will now set a precedent for companies who have been, you know, um, um, surviving or weathering the storm. Uh, because if Q3 results are better, then there's a higher possibility that their Q4 results are better. You know, and if their Q3 and Q4 results are good, then that's a good full year. And then if you have a good full year and they're a dividend paying stock, then it means, okay, you could, you may be guaranteed, you know, of, of dividends. Now, one strategy that um, um, one could use, you know, um, is, is this. We know people are looking for good yields. It's not just about whether or not you get capital appreciation or whether or not you get paid dividend. It's how much dividend. So what, what are the yields? Is it comparable to, um, to the yields you get in a similar period or a similar period for a um, for fixed income? So now we are at the end of September. October, November, is about three months, right? January, February, March, where you have dividends next year, another three months. So that's six months. What is you know the six month treasury yield? And then, okay, if we were to take um, let's put some numbers to this. If we're to take a stock like Zenith Bank, we know that last year Zenith Bank um, paid 2.8 um, naira for the final year dividend. Okay, so we take that 2.8 naira. We know that they, they tried their possible best not to pay below what they paid before. So um, we can, to some level of degree of comfort, assume that they will pay 2.8 naira. So you take that 2.8 naira and you discount it by at least what a six month um, treasury bill will give you. And then that gives you the price that you need to buy, you know, Zenith Bank at to get, you know, a yield that is equivalent to the treasury bill. You know, so those are, those are one of um, one of the strategies that, that you could use. And it works really well for dividend paying stocks, stocks that you know, okay, um, at least for the past three, four years, they have consistently paid dividend. Mm. So that, that's one thing that, you know, you know um, Companies and, and investors could could you know really just look at and say okay at the very so that worst case scenario I mean even if you do not get any capital appreciation the dividend that you get in six months time should be able to cover you know I mean what you would get for the same um, 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 treasury now ideally okay. ideally you would want to use inflation rates so that you could okay. get real positive results but okay. then if you start to do that you may start to get prices that you know some stock prices are nowhere near right now. Okay. So, worst case scenario, the best you know, stable use for the same um, um, period of time. The National Pension Commission, that's PENCOM, says it has approved guidelines for workers to get a residential mortgage using their retirement savings account, as the RSA. According to the commission, the RSA holders can withdraw 25% from their retirement savings account balance as equity contribution to purchase or maintain a home, land, all other types of real estate. Onose Sotie and our law investment analyst is still here with me to dissect this. Onose, the Pencom released their new guidelines for accessing 25% of RSA for equity contributions. Can you shed more light on the most important rules for this? Uh, yes. So um, one, I believe the most, or which is one of the most important rules is you must have been contributing for about 60 months, um, which is about five years before you are eligible you know, um, for you know um, this uh, um, for this 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 uh, this new um, development. Um, secondly, if you are within three years of your retirement, you are not eligible. Um, you know, um, if twenty five percent of your RSA is less than um, the the required equity, you know, um, yes, the, the equity required by your mortgage lender you have to put up, you know, um, the difference first before, you know, the RSA now then sends uh, your, 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 um, your, your PFA now sends um, the remaining money, the remainder to uh, the mortgage lender. Um, now, there are, there are more rules, but I feel like I agree that these are, you know, these are like the most pertinent ones, you know, that you would need to, you know, keep in mind when looking for it. Okay, so... This particular news by the PENCOM was received with mixed reactions. We saw mortgage lenders who believe that it's a, some lenders believe it's a step forward. Some have their reservations. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, the best way to really dissect this is to look at the data. Mm. So let's, let's put some numbers to it to make this a bit interesting. Um, what is the mean monthly salary in Nigeria or in Lagos? 
Um, it depends on where you look. I mean, some in international, you know, um, um, some international, you know, repositories will tell you it's three hundred thousand naira, which you know I believe you know, that's quite high. Some others will tell you it's about forty-two thousand five hundred naira, which sounds more, you know, um, a bit more realistic, especially, especially for the you know the entire the entire nation. I'm um, seeing that. Um, I think I believe your average Nigerian, I mean, lives below sixty-six dollars per month. You know, so now if you take um, let's say let's 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 do this with the best case scenario first, right? You earn three hundred thousand naira a month. That's about three point six million roughly a year. Um, pension contributions are about eighteen percent, ten percent from your employer, eight percent from you. Um, so about eighteen percent of three hundred thousand is about uh, fifty-four thousand every month that you contribute. Now you have to have contributed for about sixty months. So times 60, that's about 3.2 million when you have contributed. Now, so 25% of that is about 810,000 that pen from you know, um, your, your, your you know, pension manager will be willing to put up. Now, what's the median price of like a two-bedroom house in Lagos? You are looking at 20 million, you know, 20 million, 30 million. So now most um most mortgage lenders require you to, to um, you know, put down at least um, 30% of, of, you know, the price of the house. That's 7.5 million. But if you're any 300,000, which is quite generous, it's quite above average, you know, then you only have 810,000, but you need to put down 7.5 million. Mm. On its own, this rule, makes a lot of sense. But when you look at the wider economy, it's not really as much of a step forward as probably Pencom would think mm -hmm. because prices are way too high. You know, um, we live below the, in Nigeria, we live below the poverty line. So most of our wages are, are, are below that. But house prices are, uh, housing prices in Nigeria compete with those in developed countries, actually. So it's, it's, there's still a huge mismatch, even with this. So the truth is, the only people, the only set of people who would realistically be able to benefit from this are people who would already be able to afford houses outright, which is people who are, you know, the top earners, probably over a million, two million mm. earning, you know, a month, which are basically managers, C-level exec executives. So this doesn't help the common man as much as they would think. And the problem with housing in Nigeria is, is not that we need to pay for the houses that they currently are. We need cheaper houses and we need more houses. I mean, um, reports in back in August um, said that our, place, our, our housing deficits in Nigeria are about 28 million units that would require about 21 trillion naira to bridge. Mm -hmm. I mean, the active RSA funds are about 1.24 billion. The retiree IRSA funds are about 1.07 trillion, rather, um, 1.2 you know, $2.4 trillion, $1.07 trillion. So even all of the funds, the pension managers, is not enough to bridge the gap. Mm. Oh, you know, so while this. this is a step forward, it's not as big a step as mm. one would hope. And it's not one that would immediately, you know, effect change in, in, in the housing yeah. industry in Nigeria right now. Well, this huge gap that we're seeing in the housing sector that we need to bridge. Uh, we're wondering how this will impact, you know, the mortgage lenders themselves, especially those on the stock exchange. You know, we saw the week that news was announced, we saw on the NASD mortgage stocks were rising, you know, they topped the, the charts. We're just wondering if this is going to impact the stock market positively. Um, it depends. It depends on how much um, people take to this rule uh, because if this causes an uptick in the number of loans taken out mm -hmm. then yes you know um, mortgage companies could increase in value you know increase their profits which generally and generally be rewarded with you know higher you know um, stock prices in the market uh, but then again if you now look at the increase in the NPR um, NPR was increased recently the, the crash reserve ratio was increased about 2 by five percent. So um, that's that's um, so that's for banks, but for mortgage mortgage lenders, the NPR was increased to 15.5 percent. So now their rates will most probably increase and go up. 
And if there's one thing we know about mortgage lenders in this country, they don't like to take long tenures. If, for example, um, union, um, union banks um, mortgage lending arm, um, their you know, longest tenure is about 15 years at a rate of between 16 to 19%. So that is not really favorable. You know, and so if other mortgage lenders adopt similar um, lending policies, then it might just end up being too unfavorable for people, despite mm. you know Pencom's guidelines. guidelines. And then you know we may not see significant movement. You know, I mean, in the future, further down the line, in for you know uh, mortgage stocks. Now, speaking of high interest rates, we're saying that when the, the U.S. too, that we saw a jump in mortgage, interest rates in mortgage when the inflation, the NPR was raised and similar things is probably going to happen in Nigeria. But we'll watch and see. Um, many thanks, uh, Mr. Nosea Sotier, Naolo, investment analyst, Main Street Capital, for joining us on the program and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you for having me. And that's it on Capital Market. To join us same time next week, I'm Willie Bong. Thanks for watching.